Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for joining day four of our 2020 virtual user meeting, cardiac safety testing from ion channels to human hearts. My name is Jason Villa Gomez, marketing manager at Nanian Technologies, and will be your moderator for today's presentations. By default, all participants are muted, and upon completion of the presentation, I will open up the floor to questions. We encourage you to submit your questions throughout the course of the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Oliver Wiemeyer, Managing Director of Accelerate, GmbH, and Dr. Tim Strassmeyer, Director of Scientific Operations, Nanyan Technologies. Their presentation is entitled, Turning Cells into Reagents. I will now hand over to Oliver for the start of the talk. Okay, thank you, uh, Jason, for the nice introduction and Adrian for inviting us to, to, to give a presentation here. I hope you can hear me all well, otherwise I would get a sign, I'm pretty sure. I would start with a little excursion now, so not talking about ion channels directly, but give you a little bit overview about using assay ready cells and preparing assay ready cells before I hand over to Tim, who will be then bring you back to, to the ion channel field in particular. So using cells like a reagent, not from a continuous culture, but from a frozen cryostock uh, without prior cultivation has already been established in, in 20, uh, 2004. I guess it was GSK who introduced that as a that, that SLAS or SBS meeting, demonstrating that they use the cells directly um, without any, any uh, cultivation in a high throughput screening mode. And at that time, we actually jumped on this technology with my previous company. And now at Accelerate, um, we, we are offering um, asset-ready kits, off-the-shelf kits, but also do a lot of custom production for, uh, for our clients to prepare asset-ready cell banks, which they can use for, for, the, for their projects. So to give you an introduction and why assay ready salt is so important and why it's this so, so frequently and, and broadly used nowadays, since 2004 it has been spread all, all over uh, different areas. Uh, you may all know that there are a lot of determinants which are pretty difficult to control in cell culture, which in fact have an impact on the quality of the cells. It's not just the cell cultivation protocol, it's also the different labs and different operators who are handling the cells, different equipment you're using, culture vessels from different suppliers, very important medium and in particular serum, which can have an impact on the performance of the cells. And finally, also cellular para parameters like sterility, the cell identity, do you have any cross contaminations with different cells and also the age of the cells or the cell passage, which can have an uh, important and a significant impact in, in the outcome of your assay results. And when you think about, about, about the classic way of cell supply from a continuous culture, you will grow the cells in small tissue culture flasks and the day before your assay or at the day of the assay, you are harvesting the cells and dispense them into your assay plates or into your uh, chips for the, for the patch clamp analysis. Um, so all these cell culture dependent uh, variables will have an impact on your assay. Depending from lot to lot, you have past drift of the cells and of course you will always have a um, slight risk of contamination. So as I introduced you 2004 or five, um, this, what I say, small, smarter way, way of cell supply got established. And this is what, what, we, are, what we are doing to prepare uh, large cell banks uh, and cryopreserve these and use these pre-qualified aliquots directly in your assay. And by this, you can exclude all these variations from cell cultivation from day to day um, from, from your assay performance. And this is of course very convenient to use and much more reliable. So the idea is that you have these pre-qualified aliquots, thaw them and use them directly in, an, in your assay like a reagent. So there are of course a lot of benefits coming with the use of assay ready cells. First of all, we did some calculations. You will, depending on the assay, save between 10 to 30% of your laboratory resources when you prepare or use large batches of cells in comparison to a continuous maintenance culture. Uh, second, you will work with 
homogeneous cell banks which are pre-qualified for, for the assay. And by this, of course, very much improve the precision of your assays and, and decrease the risk of your assays to fail. And those cells, those pre-qualified aliquots will be instantly available in the quality and amount you need at any time. So if you decide you need more, you have to perform more assays, but have not prepared sufficient cells, um, then, then that's not, not so good. But when using assay-ready cells, you will have those cells available um, at a certain time point. But even after years, if you think about uh, the use for bioassays where the, where the cells need to be available in the same quality uh, over a long period of time, assay-ready cells are the solutions for this. And finally, um, assay-ready cells are very convenient to use, like in reagents also from unexperienced, inexperienced operators. If you think about outsourcing your assay to a CRO, and it might be sometimes difficult to transfer this assay protocol to them. Um, and this is mostly due to the cultivation of the cells to transfer this. Uh, if you work with assay-ready cells and your CRO is working with um, the same batch of cells, then, then you're good, then you do not have to trans only have to transfer the, the actual assay protocol. So uh, because of this, assay ready cells or the application of assay ready cells have been uh, very widely accepted and used. It started in drug discovery, and that's where we, we jumped in with, with our, my first company. So it's been used for high throughput screening campaigns in pharma for the, di the discovery of new chemical entities, but also for the identification of functional ingredients in cosmetics and food industry. Um, in pharma, it's also widely used now since about 2012 uh, in GMP bioassays to uh, so potency assays to control the quality, the performance of recombinant therapeutic proteins and anti antibodies and also in vaccines. And this is used in development, but also in clinical serology to, in, in, during the development phase. And finally, of course, in, in pharma, uh, it's used for safety pharmacology. That's where we are talking about today and in ATMI, but also in safety testing for cosmetic industry, household, medical devices, and food. You see there are broad applications for cell-based assays and everywhere basically you can use assay-ready cells. And this is a really precise and accurate method. I show you here some, some data which we generated a while ago. The left chart shows you four independently prepared batches of assay-ready cells from a reported a, a, a recombinant uh, um, GPCR expressing cell line and those independent assays have been performed and you see that those four batches um, perform more or less it identical in an HTRF assay. And the chart on the right hand side shows you a correlation uh, over 45 different projects um, comparing assay ready cells with cells from a continuous maintenance culture and those are assays, reported gene assays, HCRF assay, proliferation assays, and also patch clamp um, analysis are included here. And over all those projects, we saw a really great correlation between the assay ready cells and the continuously cultured cells in terms of EC50. So this is a really uh, reliable and precise method in comparison to cells from a continuous culture. So the question is, what makes assay, what makes cells actually assay ready in comparison to a standard cryopreservation protocol? That there is, first of all, no really secret ingredient in there uh, which makes this possible. This is more or less all good cell culture practice. So you first have to uh, care for a very controlled cell expansion because the, the, the quality of the, cells, of the cells you have when you cryopreserve them, this is the quality you will get when you perform the assay. They can't get better. So this is very important that the cells are in a perfect shape when you harvest them for, for the preparation of the assay-ready cell bank. Then you have to harvest them very gentle in the logarithmic growth phase. Um, in particular, if you're dealing with receptors, 
um, uh, a harsh handling of the self during detachment will of course um, be not really, really good. So we use acutase as an enzymatic detachment reagent, uh, which is very good and gentle in our hands. Uh, the most two important points are here actually the optimization of the cryopreservation medium um, to recover cells from a cryostock. The culture medium with 10% DM, DMSO will usually do a good job, but if you want to have your cells really assay ready, you should think about an optimization of the freezing media, and there is definitely no one-fits-all media. And second, this is the cryopreservation protocol, and I will show you some, some data on this, this later. Finally, of course, also the, the storage of your cells in liquid nitrogen and, and also the protocol of thawing and preparing the cells for your assay is very important and you have to follow some guidelines here as well. So the freezing medium, we have developed our own serum-free freezing medium and our freezing medium general and the idea is we completely started from scratch with the rationale that cells which are frozen, which are cryopreserved, uh, will probably have different requirements than, than cells which are in, supposed to grow and to proliferate. Um, so we started from scratch and we re removed glucose because frozen cells do not you need glucose because they're not growing and replaced this by higher molecular sugars. We removed serum completely, not to have it serum free per se, but to remove the growth factors from the freezing medium, which we think might bring some cells into a kind of conflicting situation, uh, whether, whether they grow or be in a quiescent state when they're frozen. Uh, we altered the os osmolarity of the freezing medium because cells which are frozen uh, have different requirements here. And finally, this is a general take home message. Probably we reduce the DMSO amount to 5%. A lot of people still using 10%, which in our hands is way too much. 5% or even lower is sufficient for most of the cells. We haven't found any really good replacement for DMSO. This is still the best. There are a couple of substitutes, um, but none is really better than DMSO, so we stay with that. But 5%, the lower, the better, of course. I mentioned all, already that the freezing protocol, the cryopreservation of the cells is really critical. If you cryopreserve your cells in a, a kind of isopropanol filled container like a mustard frosty or a gel filled container, um, you will probably achieve a cooling rate of one degree per minute, which is still kind of a standard. That's not the optimum for all of the cells, so also this could be optimized, the cooling rate. Um, but if you're using Mr. Frosties, you um, will see something like uh, in the temperature profile below. The temperature is decreasing um, at one degree per minute, and at this certain point where the crystallization sets in, latent heat is released. Uh, from the cells, which results in an increase in temperature, and then the temperature is uh, decreasing again. Um, and this increase in temperature is actually um, really detrimental to the cells. They will recover well, they will be of a high viability probably, but some cells will really don't like that, and, some, and the cells will definitely be uh, functionally Im impaired uh, if you use this method. So this is why we're using a controlled rate freezer, which not only really controls the, the decrease in temperature to one degree per minute or whatever you found to be best for yourself. It also com compensates this very moment where crystallization sets in and latent heat is released by um, floating this chamber with liquid nitrogen or vapor, vapor liquid nitrogen to compensate the increase in temperature. And by this, you really get a smooth decrease in temperature and this very much improves the functional quality of your frozen cells to be assay ready. This is an example here to show how this can be improved by using and an optimized freezing median and optimized freezing protocol. THP1 cells, I don't know who is familiar with those cells, it's the human monocytic cell line, 
which grows actually pretty well and which can also be frozen pretty well, but the recovery can be sometimes difficult. On the left chart here, you see um, propidium iodide staining uh, followed by flow cytometry. And on column A, those are cells from a continuous culture. So these are suspension cells, easy to, to assay um, directly after feeding, uh, 24, 48 hours uh, later, the viability is great, and there are very, very few cells propidium iodide positive. So it's a good continuously cultured, uh, continuously passaged culture. When you cryopreserve THP1 cells using a isopropanol container, 10% freezing medium, so the standard conditions, you will realize that directly after thawing, viability is still very good. No. Uh, almost no dead cells or damaged cells in there. But 24 hours to 48 hours later, the amount of damaged PI positive cells significantly increase. And everybody who works with THP1 cells uh, will confirm that, that those cells need a week or two to recover from a standard cryo stock to be used in a, any cell-based assay. And when we have opt after we optimize the cryopreservation protocol and, and for the THP1 cells in column C, we were able to overcome um, this um, kind of uh, decrease in viability. There's still a few PI positive cells, but the cells recover very well from the cryostock and can be immediately used in a cell based assay. As you can see at the right chart, this is the dose response from a from a proliferation or anti-proliferation assay. And you see that compared to the continuous culture in green, the cells which have been frozen according to a standard protocol, the proliferation was significantly decreased, um, uh, which narrows down the assay window, of course. While with the optimized assay ready protocol in red, we were almost as good in a proliferation uh, assay um, as the cells from a continuous culture. So those cells do not go through a significant lag phase after thawing. And this is always the, the major target when you prepare assay-ready cell banks. So based on, on, on this protocol, we have established at Accelerate a production process to prepare assay-ready cell banks. If it's a custom service, production or if it's an, an our, for our own catalog product, we grow the cells, adherent cells and cell stacks, suspension cells, we grow in hyper flasks up to 10 or 20 billion cells in a batch. And then all cells will be harvested at a single time point pool. So this is a truly batch. And with them, we have an automatic dispensing device from Fluidix, or now it's Brooks, I guess, which very reliable and reproducible dispenses the uh, cells into standard cryovals. Then we freeze them in a controlled rate freezer and um, store them in vapor phase of liquid nitrogen until they pass our quality control. And by this, process, we, were, we are able to prepare batches of up to 1,000 vials, uh, which are very homogeneous uh, in functional, functional assays. And this is uh, where we prepared also patch-ready cells, which are ion channel expressing cells, voltage-gated and ligand-gated ion channels, which we partnered or in-licensed from, from, from different companies. So we have as a product of the shelf, a set of cardiac ion channels. So the sodium and potassium ion channels have been developed by a basis from Switzerland and we license the cells from them um, and, prepare and prepare and offer them in an assay ready format. And our recent acquisition is a, a CAF 1.2 cell line, which has been developed from Steinbeis Innovation in collaboration with, with NME using the Igami technology from Steinbeis. And those cells, very reliable, express the, the calcium channel with very low rundown and have been validated um, in assay ready format uh, as well. So I don't think we have data from Nanion here, but, but we've just established this and this will come later. And then we also have some trip channel cell lines and P2X receptor channel cell lines, which have been developed by Assayworks. 
and which we provide in an essay ready format as well. And now I would like to hand over to Tim to move back to the um, ion channel data and so show you some results uh, with this cell. Okay, uh, let's see, share. Okay, I'm assuming you can see my screen and hear me okay. Um, just to get started, I'd like to say hello friends. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so today I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my experience uh, working with uh, Accelerate uh, patch ready cells that are expressing a variety of the cardiac ion channels. So the cardiac ion channel uh, panel of uh, patch ready cells is a, a really important uh, tool to use, uh, especially in light of uh, the initiative that's been spearheaded by the FDA and other, other groups. And, and CIPA stands for the Comprehensive In Vitro Proarrhythmia Assay, and it has four main components. And these four main components are all meant to work together and integrate together to provide a, a reliable assessment of cardiac uh, risk for when you're developing new drugs. And so the main four components are the drug effects on cardiac ion currents, um, there's in silico modeling. There's effects on in, uh, human induced pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. And then there's clinical electrophysiology that feeds back into the, into the ultimate model that comes out of this. So one of the really core uh, features of, of the CIPA is figuring out uh, drug effects on cardiac ion channels. And there's a number of, of ion channels um, that Oliver alluded to. The, one of the main uh, concerns is the Herg ion channel, which is IKR current, uh, which is responsible for some of the repolarization of the uh, cardiac action potential. But there's other potassium channels that uh, contribute, such as the KV4.3, KCNQ, and the inward rectifier. The currents that uh, act in an excitatory fashion are the ones that carry the sodium ion and the calcium ions. Um, and so the, the purpose of, of the experiments that I conducted at Nanny and here in New Jersey was to evaluate the performance of the Accelerate patch ready cells. And to do this, we used our high throughput uh, patch clamp system, the Synchro Patch. Uh, this is a picture here of the Synchro Patch 384i. This is the latest. Uh, uh, version of our 384 well throughput uh, patch clamp uh, system. And uh, just to mention that the actual experiments I did were on the precursor to this machine, the Synchro Patch, patch Engine 384. But the, uh, the assays are, are completely transferable. All right, so Oliver has already gone through and, and covered uh, the advantages of using assay-ready frozen cells. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, you get consistently high viability. Uh, and, and these panels here, the upper left shows you what the cells look like immediately after thawing. And then you can see pictures of the cell monolayers after culture. Uh, but the, the real point here is all you have to do is take a, a, a vial out of the liquid nitrogen, thaw it, use the uh, procedure, for recovery and put it directly onto the synchro patch. So you, you have good consistency, good quality. You avoid all of these things in cell culture uh, that tend to drive us crazy all the time. You have to wait a couple of weeks for the cells to come up. Uh, the cells get too confluent and you think, oh, did that affect my experiment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the other half of this equation, of course, is the high throughput system, or in this case, using the synchro patch, which is a 384 channel high throughput uh, patch clamp apparatus. Uh, and the advantages of, of this system is it offers gigaseal recordings on a borosilicate glass substrate. So it's, it's pretty much the same uh, interaction between plasma membrane and borosilicate glass that you get from standard manual patch clamp. Uh, our patch clamp technology is integrated 
into a state-of-the-art liquid handling background, which is the uh, I-5 series from Beckman Coulter. Uh, there's a number of options, uh, internal and external perfusion while recording, uh, which can be quite useful. Um, and there's a number of things that are advantages of the sinker patch that are really kind of tailored towards SIPA. For one, you have a temp control unit that allows you to make your recordings at physiological temperatures. Uh, our patch clamp consumable chips uh, come in varieties that allow you to do single hole and multi hole chips. And it's of high interest in, in some cases to really examine uh, the currents on single cells at a time. And, and our chips allow you to do that very easily. Uh, it's also another feature of the sinker patch is that it allows for easily sampling uh, from the, directly from the recording chamber for drug concentration measurements uh, right after the experiment. So uh, this is another uh, thing that's becoming important for the SIPA uh, initiative and actually is actually to verify what the actual concentration of the drug is uh, at the time of the experiment in the actual recording chamber. Um, and other, there's a, a, many, many features of the sinker patch, and I don't want to get too far into it um, because I could go on and on. But uh, to get started, this is a snapshot of the first experiments that we ran um, and on the NAV 1.5 uh, cell line from Accelerate. And just to take one step backwards, uh, this was really a test of patch ready cells. So I took these cells uh, and just thawed them according to the procedure and ran. I didn't do any optimizations. Uh, this, is a, this is a first look to see, are these truly patch ready? Um, of course, there, there can be some optimizations of the assay as, as you, if you were to implement this as a screening protocol. Uh, but this gives you a snapshot of what you get on the sinker patch directly out of the box. Okay, so this is the, the standard voltage protocol that we're using. This was the SIPA protocol at the time. There's a preconditioning pulse to minus 120 to help uh, deal with uh, accumulation of inactivation over time. Um, and what we're measuring is a peak inward sodium current in response to a, a step to uh, depolarizing potential, then there's a, uh, a further step to plus 40, and then a ramp back down to the holding potential. And it's during that ramp down that we, me we measure uh, what they call the sodium late current. So what we're actually doing is, is monitoring two different currents at the same time, the peak current and the late current. Now, in, this, in these cells, there's very little late current uh, uh, and just resting cells. And so what we do to elicit a measurable late current is we apply 25 nanomolar of a toxin called ATX2, which uh, serves to slow down the, the inactivation of the sodium channel. And, and you can see in this panel in the middle here, uh, a trace of the sodium current before and after ATX2. So you can really see how uh, dramatic that change is when you add the, this toxin. But what it does is it allows you to get a nice measurable late current. Okay, uh, what we're seeing in this lower panel here is, wait, uh, let's, not get, let's not go there yet. Um, the top panel shows you the setup of the experiment. So we have two columns of wells uh, where we have just vehicle control, and then across the plate, we're adding a single concentration in, of an increasing concentration response curve of tetracaine. And this is the basic uh, flow here. Uh, we establish a baseline with ATX2, add the tetracaine, achieve steady state, and then come in with a, a full block of, uh, that should be 100 micromolar, not 100 millimolar tetracaine, sorry. Um, and then we, we use that to normalize the current and create a dose response curve for the peak current and the late current. And what you see is that, in fact, there is a significant difference in the potency for tetracaine versus peak and late. And that's one of the features uh, that you want to be able to record when you're integrating all this data for the SIPA initiative. In the table here, what I'm doing is I'm capturing the, the basic parameters of this assay. So the basic success rate and milestones. So the catch, the number of uh, the percentage of wells where we actually capture a cell is high, it's above 90%. The seal rate uh, at the end of the experiment uh, is 85%, which is quite good. Uh, the 
We also have quality control criteria for current. And so for the peak, we want it to be more than 300 peak amps. We got 95% of those wells achieving that. And for the late current, uh, similar uh, situation, but we have a slightly different cutoff, 75 peak amps. At the end of the day, the overall success rate incorporating all of our quality control parameters is, is right around 80%, which is, is quite good. Um, and the other thing to note is that the current expression itself is also quite robust, five nanoamps for the peak and about two nanoamps for the late current. And, and we also were able to record the, uh, the IC50s for uh, tetracaine in both situations. And again, I'm, it might be, uh, it should have been uh, micromolar, not millimolar. Sorry about that. So moving on to the first of the potassium channels. And again, it's a very uh, similar setup. Uh, here's the voltage protocol, a holding potential of minus 80, a rapid ramp phase uh, to plus 40 elicits uh, an outward current of potassium, which goes undergoes some inactivation. Again, we establish a reference solution phase here where we uh, measure a stable current in the absence of blocker, then uh, we add blocker, achieve a steady state, and then finally follow up with a full block, uh, in this case, high quinidine and barium chloride. And so again, it's the same thing, one concentration of drug per well and a concentration response curve across the plate. And this is the uh, heat map where uh, the vehicle controls show uh, zero effect, essentially, of the drug all the way up to pretty much uh, full block in the high 90% of block at the high concentrations of quinidine. Uh, quinidine is a little bit of a, a weak blocker. And I think my formatting must have been lost because everything's been changed to millimolar when it should be micromolar. Uh, sorry about that. So uh, it's not a very potent blocker, but it is a useful tool compound for KV 4.3. What I'm showing in the middle panels here, and these are the average currents for each of the different concentrations of quinidine. And the these are the average current traces for each of the different uh, concentrations of quinidine. The, the black trace here is actually the control before quinidine, and then each of oops, each of the subsequent additions or subsequent concentrations of quinidine are shown in the, in the light blue. And the full block is the other black trace. And again, we get a very nice dose response. Um, in this case, uh, the capture rate success rate was very high. Seal rate again is in the mid 80s. Uh, we have a very good, robust current expression in these cells as well. 97% have at least 400 peak grams of current. Uh, the overall success rate for this uh, patch ready uh, cell line was 84%. Uh, average current 2.5. Um, vehicle effect uh, in this case was uh, 23, 24%. Uh, and it's something I didn't mention directly, but the sodium channel uh, rundown was very minimal. Uh, in fact, with the late current, it was a slight run up. Uh, in this case, we noticed uh, a little bit of, of rundown, but it's in the manageable range. So this is the one situation where we actually followed up with a second assay because we were a little bit concerned to see you know, a quarter of the current lost during the assay. And so we decided to run a second run where we ran it in perf perforated patch mode. Uh, where you help to maintain the, you don't dialyze the contents of the cell during the assay. So you have a perforator, in this case, beta essen, uh, that allows you electrical access without dialyzing the contents of the cell. And in this case, um, just to focus in on the vehicle effect for the whole cell that I just described, it was 24%. And in perforated patch mode, uh, it's significantly reduced, so uh, 9%. So this is some gives you an inkling of where you can start to uh, tweak the conditions and really boost your success rates. The unfortunate thing here though, is that the, the overall success rate in my perforated run uh, in terms dropped a little bit because of the seal rate was a little bit lower. So playing with some of these, uh, uh, like the concentration of the Essen, for example, you could probably achieve a really good balance between getting really good seal rates and really good rundown. Uh, but it'll require a little bit more uh, tinkering. Okay, moving on to uh, KVLQT1. 
uh, min k. This is KCNQ, KCNE1, uh, depending on what nomenclature you're using. And this is, again, is an, a potassium conductance. It's a, it, it's a very slow uh, rising phase of the potassium current uh, in response to a voltage step to plus 60. And in fact, it's, it's long enough that we don't record part of this trace just to save the storage space on the disk. Um, and, and, but it, again, it's the same uh, assay setup. We do a reference period where we establish uh, a baseline for the cur outward current. We add uh, a single concentration of drug and followed by a high concentration a full block condition to normalize uh, the compound effect. And again, you look at the heat map, we see a very nice concentration response across the plate in this case for the compound HMR 1556. Uh, get a very nice uh, concentration response curve uh, for uh, the normalized effect. Um, and what I'm showing the middle panels, again, is the averaged uh, current versus time plots for uh, all the different concentrations of HMR. And here's the averaged uh, current traces for all the different concentrations of HMR 1556. And what you'll notice right away is that in this case, um, you could see clearly, even during the, uh, the reference phase, there's, there's some rundown going on. And so when I get to uh, the overall uh, parameters here, you'll, you'll zero in on the vehicle effect right away and see that there's about a 35% uh, decrease uh, for the vehicle uh, over the course of the assay. And in this case, we actually had an inkling that this would be the case. And so we started out by running in perforated patch mode, which is, I didn't mention, uh, but this is a perforated patch experiment. So we, I think with this uh, assay, it, it is a little bit more difficult just because it's a, the channel has a natural propensity for rundown. But with all that said, um, really nice data that could be achieved from the cell line in terms of the very high capture efficiency, uh, really good seal performance at 83%, and again, really robust uh, current expression. In this case, 100% of the cells uh, had a current that achieved our minimum cutoff of 500 picoamps, which gives you an overall uh, success rate of, of 83%. Um, and an IC50 for the, the test compound of about 100 nanomolar. Moving on, the inward rectifier uh, conductance uh, of, of the cardiac ion channel suite. Uh, this is in a, in this case, in a whole cell mode on a four hole chip. Uh, in this case, we're measuring the current uh, in response to a depolarizing pulse to plus 20 millivolts, which is then followed by a ramp phase down to minus 120. And since this is an inward rectifier, uh, what, we're re what we're looking for is actually the inward potassium current because uh, they don't really um, pass uh, outward potassium currents uh, very well. And so what you do is you measure the, the peak of the inward current uh, during that ramp down phase. And again, uh, the same setup, one concentration of compound per well. In this case, we're using a barium chloride as our test compound. And the heat map, again, shows a nice uh, concentration response curve. And you can see that in the averaged uh, IT plots here. Um, and the averaged uh, current traces here for all the different concentrations of barium chloride. Um, in this assay, uh, the cells performed quite well just at the basic properties level. Uh, the catch rate was near 100%. Uh, the seal rate uh, was in the, in the mid 90s, about 96%. And again, 100% uh, of the cells had robust uh, current expression. That was really nice to see. And the overall success rate then is about 96%. Uh, the vehicle effect in this case, I mean, this is probably the best case out of all of them. Uh, rock solid, uh, run down of only about 4% over the course of the assay. Um, and we're able to get a nice IC50 for a barium, uh, which is 9.3 micromolar, not 9.3 millimolar. Uh, that's, that's a really nice one. And so the last one I have to present to you is probably the most important. So the Herg ion channel 
is the uh, is a very promiscuous drug uh, target. So uh, there are a lot of drugs out there um, that uh, let's just say Herg is a very promiscuous target. A lot of small molecule compounds hit Herg and cause inhibition of Herg. And in, in clinical practice in the past, that has led to uh, issues with, um, with cardiotoxicity. Um, we won't get too far into that, but just to say that this is probably one of the most important ion channels to understand uh, among the, the suite of cardiac ion channels uh, that are available. So the voltage protocol uh, for the Herd is a holding potential of minus 80. There's an activation phase to plus 40, but you really uh, are interested in this tail current that you measure um, when you step back to minus 40 millivolts. Uh, it's this outward peak outward is what we're interested in. Uh, and again, we establish a reference phase of the, of the IT plot, uh, apply a single concentration of drug, wait for steady state, and then hit it with a hammer dose, full block condition. In this case, I'm looking at cisapride as a test compound. Um, the heat map again looks very nice. Uh, we see um, uh, a good concentration response to cisapride. These are the average IT plots again. So at the higher concentrations, we're achieving full block. And you can see that in, the, um, in this plot down in the lower right, we're really hitting saturation um, and able to measure an IC50 of, actually this is, this is wrong, it's 21 nanomolar. Um, and the current traces, the average current traces for all the different concentrations of cisapride are here. Again, we had a really good capture success rate at 98%. The seal rate was quite good at 81. Um, and again, really good uh, expression of the channel on this four hole chip uh, in whole cell mode. Uh, almost 100%, 99.4% had uh, met our minimum cutoff of 100 picoamps, uh, at which gives us an overall success rate uh, above 80%, which is the, has been the case for all of our uh, patch ready cells. Uh, let's see. And then in this case, a pretty, pretty stable uh, 20, a little bit of run up in this case of about 13% in the vehicle controls. So I just wanted to add one last facet uh, to our analysis of these data from the, from the patch ready cells, um, which is, you know, what, I, what I've been showing you here is a cisapride uh, concentration response curve, which has 11 points in it. So uh, broken up this chip into uh, double columns, each containing a different, each receiving a different concentration of cisapride. But that's a little bit overkill for a 384 well system uh, because I'm giving, I'm feeding in an, a maximum N of about 32 wells for each concentration. So most people don't need an N equals 32 at each concentration and it's a bit overkill. Um, and, and what I'm interested in is if you're screening a lot of compounds, uh, what are the screening properties of this assay? How, how many compounds do you think we could actually uh, get onto a single chip? And so that's what I'm trying to, to get at with, with looking at some of the screening properties of this particular assay with the herd channel. You can calculate what's called a Z prime score, which basically tells you the separation uh, between the mean and standard deviation of your vehicle control and the mean and standard deviation of your full block situation. And if those are really well separated, you'll get a higher number. And typically in screening, if you have a Z prime value of 0 0.5 and above, uh, that's a very good ass assay for screening. Uh, the maximum Z prime you can get for perfection is one. Um, you can actually have Z prime values of negative, and that's where your standard deviations are overlapping. And so being above 0.5 is quite good. And that gives me confidence to say, I could probably cut down the number of replicates per concentration that I'm using. And so I did a, an analysis where I cut the chip into rows and treated each row as if it were a separate compound. And that would give me an N equals two uh, at each concentration for 16 compounds. And then what I did is I plotted the IC50 for each one of those individuals individually. Um, and what I'm showing here for each of these blue dots is 16 
replicates, essentially, of the Cisopride IC50. And I'm showing here in green, this is the average at about 20. <laughs> Okay, uh, I don't know if anybody, anybody else heard that, but uh, uh, these, these, these um, red bars here represent plus and minus twofold from the average. And so this confirms that the Z prime value is telling us the truth. It's a good screening assay. We can uh, reliably get uh, consistent, uh, precise IC50s, even when you uh, run with an N equals two. Uh, for each concentration. Okay, so I think just to wrap up uh, and summarize, uh, the patch ready cells are very easy to use. I personally loved using these patch ready cells. Uh, they eliminate so much uh, of the hassle that we normally go through. If you want to, if you want to test HERG uh, and you don't have the cells in culture, you're going to be waiting a couple of weeks probably because you go through that phase where you thaw they're not performing very well, and then they recover, and then, then you can use them. That's, that's a delay. Um, there's no trypsinizing the cells. Uh, you just take them out, thaw them, and use them. So I love them uh, for that reason. Just for the lazy scientist, it's great. Um, but beyond that, um, they pretty much exceeded my expectation for going from frozen cell onto the sinker patch. So I've done this this routine uh, before in a, in a couple of instances, you know, out of, sometimes out of desperation, there's some old vials in the back of, uh, of the liquid nitrogen I needed. I just needed some cells and they never performed great right out of the liquid nitrogen. I've also done um, some work with uh, some people in pharma and we got okay results. Nothing as good as this. Um, uh, and we, we could increase the, the quality of the recordings by plating the cells onto a tissue culture dish for a couple of hours. But again, that's a real hassle. I mean, it's even worse than going from live culture, at least for the harvest procedure. So I'm really, really happy with the, with the high success rate uh, that we have to accelerate cells. And in particular, the robust channel expression. So in most cases, uh, seal rates were the defining feature for success uh, because pretty much across the board, the, the channel expression was quite robust. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think I messed up on my summary. Uh, but yeah, so the, uh, just because I, I obviously copied and pasted here. But the bottom line is that the, uh, the patch ready cells work as advertised, they are patch ready. They give you screening quality results uh, right out of the box. Um, and as Oliver alluded to, I tested all of the cardiac ion channels with the exception of, of CFE 1.2. Uh, but it's my understanding that those cells uh, are gonna be tested uh, quite soon uh, by some of my colleagues in the head, Nanian headquarters in Munich. Um, so many thanks to Accelerate for working with us on these cells and to Besis, uh, who, who are the people who engineered the cell lines in the first place. And I'd be happy to take any questions. I'm sure Oliver would as well. Thank you for uh, the presentation, Oliver and uh, Tim. I'll go ahead and moderate a little bit uh, some of the questions that we've received so far. And again, uh, if there's any questions, uh, please feel free to comment in on uh, the chat window, uh, if we don't happen to get to it right now, uh, bearing in mind that we have another talk at 4 p.m. or at the top of the hour, depending on where you're at, uh, that we will address it in, in the transcription of the on-demand copy. Uh, initially, Oliver, for you, we had a question regarding how are the cells diluted uh, when they're used for assays? Uh, for example, what is the final DMSO concentration in the assay? So we, we, we recommend, uh, according to our thawing protocol, that the cells will be washed once very quickly um, in, in the assay buffer. Um, so you will remove almost all the MSO before you use the cells. This is a, is a gentle uh, procedure with a low centrifugation for it, which does not harm the cells, but really improves the quality. 
Uh, and then another question for you, Oliver, uh, are you planning any new sales for your assay ready portfolio? Um, yeah, sure. We are, as I already pointed out, we're partnering with, with suppliers of cell lines like Basis, like the NMI, like SA Works, and um, we're constantly increasing the portfolio of, of assays. But we're not really developing the assays on our own. We're really adopting established cell lines to the assay ready protocol. Okay, got it. And then uh, another question that came into you more uh, around availability. Um, is this available in the U.S. Uh, or, or in Asia, uh, Japan uh, specifically? Yeah, we can ship also to, to Japan with, with distributors. So we, we ship cells all around the world already. Okay, perfect. Um, and then, uh, Tim, uh, does ATX to increase the peak or, or is this just the late current? I think it, it mainly affects uh, the deactivation or the inactivation phase. Um, so I think if you look at that trace, it looked like the peak was slightly lower, but I think that's because uh, the peak is slightly affected by the onset of inactivation. And so what you, it's probably a, almost 100% effect on inactivation. Okay. And then uh, were there experiments done with single hole or multi hole chips uh, for NAV 1.5? Those were done in single hole chips. Okay. Um, just keep scrolling here. Uh, can you comment a little bit more on the cell handling uh, on the system? Yeah, so I followed the, the procedure from Accelerate pretty much exactly, and it's, it's quite straightforward. It, it involves uh, taking the aliquot, putting it in the 37 degree water bath until it's just thawed, then you carefully dilute it into the recovery buffer. Uh, there's a low speed centrifugation that Oliver alluded to, uh, 80 times G, I believe it was. Um, and then just aspirate the supernatant and resuspend in your patch clamp buffer and you're ready to go. Okay. And then uh, kind of paraphrasing here, uh, throughout the course of the week, there have been other um, yeah, systems. Can you expect these assays to be transferable uh, to the patch liner or, or the port patch, for example? Yeah, absolutely. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be. Um, uh, yeah, the high, high success rates, uh, above 80%, I think, I think it, it would definitely transfer well. Okay. Uh, another one, uh, are you planning to check uh, KVLQT1, uh, MINK, and KV4.3 uh, on 37 Celsius? Also, that word part of the IK1. Since yeah. The or, uh, and yeah. The temperature. Okay. So, so the temperature question. Yeah. So definitely Nanian. That's the other thing I, I meant to mention about sinker patch is that the Nanian has been involved in all three phases of the SIPA initiative so far. And at each, each stage, the, the requirements have been sort of, uh, rethought through. So initially it was a, a set of training compounds, um, at, with a certain set of uh, quality control criteria. Um, as we've moved on, there's been more and more focus on comparing uh, results at physiological temperature and with room temperature. Now, the focus, and as this has gone on, the focus has really shifted and refined, as it's been more refined, it's really shifted away from some of the, the channels like uh, the KVLQT, KCNQ, and is, is refocused more more directly on NAV 1.5, CAV 1.2, and HERD. And so those are the ones that are, we're primarily pursuing at physiological temperature. So I, I don't think we have, at the moment, uh, plans to pursue uh, the KCNQ or the, or the CURE 2.1 or the KV 4.3 at physiological temperature because the modeling really tells us that cardiac risk is driven by, is not really driven by uh, compounds blocking or modulating those conductances. Uh, and then lastly here, just in closing, and you kind of maybe uh, alluded to this already, uh, did you use the SEPA steep ramp protocol uh, for HERD? That, that, uh... I, that's the one channel I didn't use the SIPA protocol for, so I just used the standard uh, step. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so bearing in mind that the next talk is uh, going to get going here, uh, I'm going to wrap up. Again, I'll make this uh, available on demand uh, latest tomorrow morning. It'll be on online and across uh, our, our YouTube channel. And once again, I'd like to thank Oliver and Tim for taking their time in presenting today. And I'll make sure that we can have all their contact information 
if there's any questions uh, after this meeting. Thank you for your attendance and we look forward to seeing you in a couple minutes.